The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Part 1 It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long grey beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou me? The bridegroom's door are open, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, great beard loon. F soon his hand dropped he. So we have the beginning of the poem where a wedding guest um, is stopped. He's one of three people going to the wedding. And he protests, doesn't he, that um, the bridegroom's doors are open. Um, and that he uh, is next of kin, you know, he's a part of the family, um, kin meaning family, and you can hear the merry din, the, the, the loud noises that are going on. Um, but the mariner is holding this man by the wedding guest by his skinny hand, and he starts, There was a ship, quoth he, said he, notice the ancient sort of language in this poem, and the wedding guest shouts hold off unhand me grey beard loon you know um you lunatic you, you with a grey beard f soons um it, it, very quickly um his hand dropped he so the mariner drops his hand we have um a picture by dore a woodcuts which illustrate all of um the poem that i'm going to show you um and we can see the mariner here with the wedding guest. Not quite as I imagined it, but still very evocative. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright eyed mariner. The ship was cheered the harbour cleared merrily did we drop below the kirk below the hill below the lighthouse top so um this beginning part of the poem um the the wedding guest is sort of hypnotized by the marinese he holds him the mariner holds him with his glittering eye and then the wedding guest listens like a three years child, like a child, a very young child. The mariner, the, the, the seafaring man, the sailor, hath his will, has his way. Um, the, the wedding guest sits on a stone and he, he has to listen, he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright eyed mariner. Notice we've had glittering eye and now bright eye, referring to the eyes of the mariner. And then we have in this last verse in this page we have um, the uh, ship was cheered the mariner speaking the harbour cleared um, and he's speaking with rhyme there isn't he um, merrily we did drop did we drop below the kirk the kirk is a scottish word for church uh, and the church becomes important very much later on in the poem but it's worth bearing that in mind below the lighthouse top so there's the um, wedding guest listening like a three years child. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea, higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon the wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose as she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. So the mariner starts to tell his tale. The sun came up on the left. Um, can you work out exactly what direction the ship is going from that? Um, if it came up out of the sea on the left, you should be able to work out the direction. Um, out of the sea he came he and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea so he's going down on the right into the sea so they're heading south aren't they from this um, um, he's starting to tell this tale and the wedding guest here hears the loud bassoon the, the instrument from the uh, wedding and um, 
he beats his breast. He wants to go in to see the wedding. He sees the beautiful bridegroom in the hall and the merry minstrelsy, the, the, the merry music making that's going on. He, he doesn't want to have to listen to the mariner. He wants to go into the party. And there's a picture of the party, the bride red, red as a rose, the doré woodcut of the this verse. The wedding guest, he beat his breast, he, yet he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. Now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with overtaking wings, and chased south along, with sloping masts and dipping prow, as yet who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. So, a massive storm blasts the ship southwards, um, and the, with a yell and a blow, so we get a sense of the violence of uh, the ship being blown, and we get a kind of very violent start to this poem. Um, perhaps the mariner's being quite forceful because he needs the wedding guest to listen. And there we have a wonderful woodcut, don't we, of the ship in a storm by Dore. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. And ice, mast high, came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts the snowy clifts did send a dismal sheen, nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken, the ice was all between. So they come into this very icy place, the Antarctic, where the ice is high as uh, mast high. It's as high as the masts. And we have this beautiful kind of imagery of the ice here. It was wondrous cold. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. At length did cross an albatross, thorough the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. So the ice everywhere, and then they come across this huge albatross in the, in the fog. The ice is all around, more amazing imagery from Dore. It ate the food it never had eat and round and round it flew the ice did split with a thunder fit the helmsman steered us through and a good south wind sprung up behind the albatross did follow and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow so um the ice splits with a thunder fit the helmsman steered us through so that the ship goes through the ice and it seems that the albatross has enabled this to happen. Um, a wind uh, comes up and the albatross follows them and the mariners, the sailors, hollow um, after, they, they shout after joyfully the, the albatross because it seems to have brought good luck for them. There's a picture of the albatross. In the midst or cloud on mast or shroud it perched for vespers nine whilst all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moon moonshine god save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plague the thee thus why lookst thou so with my crossbow i shot the albatross so uh the poem in the first part of the poem ends with him shooting the albatross we never actually learn why he does it um but um, it's obviously a very momentous moment um, that changes the whole nature of the mariner's life. Um, so we have this very powerful opening. Um, what I want you to do, the first two things to do, is firstly put into your own words what you actually think has happened in uh, the beginning of the poem. Either you could do that um, writing a diary of the wedding guest and imagining that you are the wedding guest listening to the story and write it from his point of view or if you want to write your own 
response to the poem and write about what you feel about the mariner and the wedding guests and the situation. And then secondly, I want you to think about the techniques that are being used to make this an interesting opening to a poem. It's a long story poem. What is of interest to you? Think about some of the characters in the poem, the story of the poem. Think about the way in which Coleridge uses language to make it interesting. Um, what really strikes you? A poem is full of dramatic imagery connected with um, the sea and with sailing um, and then at the end of the poem with the Antarctic. So um, have a go at this and then listen to my explanation of part two.